Georgists do not understand rights, owing to their absurd property theory. Make sure to watch until the end if you want to understand why. Georgism is an ideology that advocates a tax on the unimproved value of all land. Land in this context meaning any natural resource. The Georgist justifications for this tax range from commie reeing over big mean landlords to the assertion that land is jointly owned by every man, making homesteading a form of aggression. Here I shall be primarily attacking the latter stance as it is the only somewhat reasonable formulation of the Georgist ethic. First and foremost, it must be discussed what exactly it means to have a property right over a given item. Now, many see property rights as some sort of spook, or something only those nasty right-wingers care about. But in reality, whenever one proposes any ethic pertaining to law, i.e. any ethic pertaining to the just way to deal with conflicts. That ethic implies a certain theory of property rights and a corresponding system of property rights assignments. In general, in a given conflict, conflict here meaning when multiple people are trying to implement the same scarce means towards contradictory ends, the property right is assigned to the party who under the specific legal theory is denoted as the just victor in the conflict, i.e. if legal theory X assigned that in a conflict between A and B over alpha, A has the property right then under that legal theory, B would be the criminal and A the victim. Rothbardian natural law theory assigns property rights based upon the ethic of the non-aggression principle, aggression being defined as the initiation of conflict. Essentially, this can be framed as saying the purpose of property rights under Rothbardian natural law theory is to avoid conflicts. So in any given conflict, to determine who has the property right and therefore which party is acting criminally, one need only determine who has initiated the conflict. I won't go into immense detail on how exactly to do that in this video video as this is not particularly relevant. I will however give an example as a demonstration of this. Say Crusoe and Friday are on a desert island together. One day Crusoe happens upon a stick poking out of a tree and he appropriates this stick from nature, fashioning it into a spear which he plans to use for spear fishing. On his way to the ocean however, Friday sees the same stick and wants to use it instead to stoke his fire. Now Crusoe cannot use a stick to spear fish at the same time that Friday stokes his fire. So if Friday were to attempt to use the stick in his preferred way, we would have a conflict. Two men, Crusoe and Friday, are attempting to use the same scarce means, the stick, towards two contradictory ends fishing and the stoking of a fire. Here, one need only consider the causal chain to see that it is Friday who has initiated the conflict, making Friday the criminal. Kinsella notes that it is only the Rothbardian theory of property rights that makes any sense, as it would be presupposed by any who would engage in a dispute over a property claim, no matter what property theory they claim to personally hold. But what is implied in the idea that the right to possess, ownership that is, is distinct from mere possession. It means that if there is any ownership at all, and those who quarrel over things are all asserted different ownership claims and thus presupposing ownership and its distinction from possession, then it does not accrue merely to those who take things from others. That is, if B takes a thing by force from A, this cannot in and of itself make B the owner. Why? Because if it did, it means that C could take it from B and thereby become the owner. But this just means that there is no such thing as ownership, there is only possession, might makes right so to speak. But this contradicts the presumption that ownership and possession are different. From this very simple idea, we see that the entire Lockean idea of first use first own follows. Why? Because if taking some good by force from its previous possessor is not sufficient to ground an ownership claim, then by Misesian style regression, it becomes obvious that only the first possessor slash user can have an ownership claim. Every other person takes it from a previous possessor and is thus a mere possessor, not an owner. The first possessor, the person who plucks the resource out of his unknown state, out of the commons, is the only possessor who does not take it from someone else. This is why the first possession imbues the homesteader with the unique status of ownership, i.e. the first user and possessor of a good is either its owner or he is not. If he is not, then who is? The person who takes it from him by force? If forcefully taking a possession from prior owner entitles the new possessor to the thing, then there is no such thing as ownership, but only mere possession. But such a rule, that a later user may acquire something by taking it from the previous owner, does not avoid conflicts, it rather authorizes them. I will now take a more in-depth look at the specific problems with the George's property theory that claims it to be a criminal action to take from the commons. To make this claim is to imply that there must already be some property right over nature given goods, as no other could legally object to a person taking something except the owner of that thing. But who exactly is this property right afforded to? Either we decide that the property right is assigned to some arbitrary individual who has nothing to do with the good in question, or we take some non-unitary subset of all other individuals and suppose that they equally 
co-own the good in question. The first obviously falls on the grounds of being an arbitrary ethic, and therefore not one based upon conflict avoidance. And the second has two problems. First, it falls on the grounds of all group ownership, in that it cannot possibly solve conflicts between people within the group. Suppose that a set of people, A through Z, commonly own a stick. What is to be done about a dispute over the stick between members in this set? Say that A wants to use a stick to spearfish, but B does not want to use the stick in this way. Under the assumption that they both own it, they should both justly win the dispute. So the spearfishing is simultaneously just and unjust, a contradiction. Some advocates of group ownership attempt to sidestep this by having some sort of group decision-making process over the use of the stick. Say that all the members take a vote and the majority decide that the stick should be used to spearfish. This would imply that anyone who lost the vote did not own the stick as they were determined to be the just losers in the conflict over its use. But to say that they did not own the stick contradicts the assumption that all members of the set owned the stick. There exists no way out of this. Group ownership simply cannot solve for conflicts between group members. This observation holds irrespective of what property system you adhere to. You will notice that I made no reference to the property system actually needing to be derived from the root of conflict avoidance. Second, such an ethic supposes that latecomers have just as much of a right as the first comer. In addition to the above Kinsella excerpt, I quote Hans Hermann Hoppe, What is wrong with this idea of dropping the prior later distinction as morally irrelevant? First, if the latecomers, i.e. those who did not in fact do something with some scarce goods, had indeed as much of a right to them as latecomers, i.e. those who did do something with scarce goods, then literally nobody would be allowed to do anything with anything, as one would have to have all of the latecomers consent prior to doing whatever he wanted to do. Indeed, as posterity would include one's children's children, people that is, who come so late that they could never possibly ask them, advocating a legal system that does not make use of the prior later distinction as part of its underlying property theory is simply absurd in that it implies advocating death but must presuppose life in order to advocate anything. Neither we, our forefathers, nor our progeny could do or will survive and say or argue anything if one were to follow this rule. In order for any person, past, present or future, to argue anything, it must be possible to survive now. Nobody can wait and suspend acting until everyone of an indeterminate class of latecomers happens to appear and agree to what one wants to do. Rather, insofar as a person finds himself alone, he must be able to act to use, produce, consume goods straight away, prior to any agreement with people who are simply not around yet, and perhaps never will be. And insofar as a person finds himself in the company of others, and there is conflict over how to use a given scarce resource, he must be able to resolve the problem at a definite point in time with a definite number of people, instead of having to wait unspecified period of time for unspecified numbers of people, simply in order to survive then, which is a prerequisite of arguing in favour of or against anything. Property rights cannot be conceived of as being timeless and non-specific with regards to the number of people concerned. Rather, they must necessarily be thought of as originating through acting at definite points in time for definite acting individuals. One alternative justification, and in my view the only justification that is at all reasonable, comes from my friend Axel Haystrott of the Geoanarchism subreddit. The justification goes as follows, every man has a right to engage in human action, therefore anyone who interferes with this right has committed a crime. Under this system of law, anyone who appropriates anything from the commons has performed a criminal action unto everyone who is now unable to do so. There are a few problems here. First, if it is the case that appropriating anything is criminal, this would make every person a criminal by virtue virtue of acting. Action requires that man appropriate scarce means, at the very least some standing room to act in. Therefore we have a contradiction where each man has a right to act, and yet he is a criminal for doing so. The geo-anarchist may attempt to sidestep this by drawing some sort of line beyond mere standing room at which appropriation becomes unjust. But any line drawn on what means are just to appropriate beyond standing room will necessarily be arbitrary, making this not a rational system of law, and therefore a system of law which could not avoid conflicts. Furthermore, such an ethic cannot make for a human ethic, that is, without action, i.e. without the ability to appropriate scarce means, no man could survive, and therefore the anti-homestead ethic cannot assure the survival of mankind. But without any humans, there is no point in concerning oneself with what an ethic for humanity should be. Therefore, an anti-human ethic of any sort is absurd on its face. Second, we shall expand on the inability to deal with conflicts. Conflicts, as described above, are when two men are attempting to implement a given means towards contradictory ends, but that requires that the item in question even be a means in the first place, which requires that someone appropriate said means. But this appropriator is considered to be a criminal in 
meet his appropriation, therefore providing that latecomers have an equal claim to this means as he does, which is not a conflict avoiding ethic as I have described earlier. Third, if the justification that appropriation is criminal is that it is interfering with the actions of others, this leaves us with a strange double bind. We have before us a scenario where neither party was allowed to appropriate a given means in the first place, because to appropriate it would prevent the other from appropriating it, but then you are only preventing other parties from doing something that they weren't allowed to do in the first place. The final failing, which relates to the first, is that the geo-anarchist ethic falls on the grounds of its very proposal. Argumentation is not simply free-floating propositions, rather it is a human action requiring that each party appropriate scarce means, or at the very least standing room, in order to argue in the first place. Therefore, anyone who argues implicitly presupposes the homestead principle in the very act of argumentation, making any ethic that explicitly proposes an anti-homestead principle falsified via the law of non-contradiction. A particularly astute geo-anarchist may attempt to sidestep these issues by asserting that it isn't at the point of appropriation that one is acting criminally, but only when the man attempts to exclude others from his appropriated means. This sidestep, however, still fails to make a rational geoist legal system. A property right means nothing at all if it does not allow the owner the right to exclude others from his property. We revert back to the mere possessor ethic of might makes right, which is the complete rejection of law as a field of study and ignoring the problem that it is there to solve. Fred Foldvary states the following with respect to homesteading. Those who advocate homesteading rules have to confront the fact that almost all of the land titles today originate in conquest. The view that the current occupant is the homesteader, if there are no heirs of the original owner, is in effect a rule that favours the status quo. By that rule, if one murders the current occupants and they have no heirs, the conqueror has a proper possession. It is also arbitrary how much area, how much time, and what kinds of uses constitute rightful homesteading. This sentence sentiment is repeatedly expressed by Georgists, and stems from a misunderstanding of the homesteading ethic. If a person A homesteads a property X, then he is the owner of this property. This could not have come about as a result of conquest. Homesteading is specifically that establishment of a property right over land, i.e. those nature-given means that are not yet owned by anyone. Now, we suppose that X is stolen from A by B in an act of conquest. A still owns X, even if centuries pass, the descendants of A, named namely the descendant who the chain of heirship grants the property right over X to, still owns X, even though the descendants be possess X. Those titles have to lie with the owner by the definition of a title to property. In short, adherents of the homestead principle do not claim that it is the current occupant of some land that is the just owner. This would be a ludicrous theory of property, as detailed above. Rather, we say that the title of ownership is not affected by any possession by others. Such possession of a means by someone other than the owner of said means, against the owner's will, is a criminal action. As for the case of a murderer killing a man who has no heirs, we say that he definitely does not have a just claim to the property. Any third party would have a superior claim to his, as they did not initiate a conflict over its use. This implies that the title is up for grabs, so to speak. As for Foldvary's final point in the above quote, that it is arbitrary exactly what is being homesteaded, we simply turn to praxeology. Anything that a man initially possesses is rightly his, i.e. anything that he is first implementing as a means towards some end. This is not arbitrary, as any other assertion would be an endorsement of conflict initiation. There is a common tendency for Georges to have a distaste for the wealthy in society, which stems, I suspect, from the same place that it does for other socialists, economic illiteracy. The snuck premise is that those who have earned more money must have taken from others, making earning money per se an immoral thing. What this does not account for is subjective value which implies earning money through an exchange economy requires that one satisfy those men who they trade with. Imagine a hot dog vendor selling hot dogs for $5. A man purchases one of these hot dogs. Has anyone here been exploited or in some way maligned? Let's consider the vendor's perspective. He's profited, as he started out with a hot dog and ended up with $5. He clearly values the $5 more than the hot dog, or else he would not have agreed to the trade. So the vendor hasn't been exploited, but what about the customer? We notice that the exact same analysis demonstrates that the customer has also profited. He started with $5 and ended up with a hot dog. The consumer must have valued the hot dog more than the $5, or else he would not agree to the trade either. We sum this up in a law. Ex ante, there is necessary mutual profit in any voluntary trade. Under this observation, it is trivially absurd to assert that earning wealth via voluntary exchange is immoral and something to be addressed in the law, for nobody's harmed in this interaction. 
both parties come out better than they were before. This makes the geo-Marxist ethic flawed to its core, even without attacking it with an understanding of natural law. Next, if you wish to further round out your understanding of an example of natural law society, you have to watch this video, where I detail that very thing in medieval Iceland. This will be a great tool if you ever find yourself in an argument with a statist who simply must see an example of anarchism to understand it.